So this is decompress, a logging story. Uh, I have wrestled with logs for a long, long time. Uh, I've been an ops nerd for pretty much my entire career. Uh, who, what do people do in here? Uh, sysadmins? OK, so not actually that many sysadmins. That's kind of shocking. Uh, developers? See, all the sysadmins, you're also supposed to raise your hand. Like, at the same time, yes. Because you do, right? It's, I mean, you barely make it a day without writing a line of code. And if you do, I assume you were just like watching videos all day. Yeah, OK. Well, you yeah, had limelight people. Of course you do. Um, so <laughs> right, so I've done a lot of, of wrestling with logs. Um, and over time, I've come up with a few different strategies. And they've all been pretty horrible. And eventually, I'll get it right. I'm not sure I've got it right yet. But I'll at least show you what I'm doing so far. Um, I, I wrote a interface called Kibana, which is an interface for log analysis. <laughs> um, I did this because I could not afford anything that was for sale to do log analysis. Um, I, I, our, our quote for unnamed big log analysis software was in the six figures. I know people who have installations in the seven figures a year. Um, so I needed something that I could do log analysis with that wasn't grep. So I wrote this web interface to do it. And that's a bit of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm also a serial IRC addict. Uh, anybody else IRCers? How is it not the whole room? How do you people interact socially? I <laughs> Did I just say, still run an IRC server? I know they used no, to. Not long ago. I could think, it's, think, it's my, think it might be gone. Um, yeah, I, I can't stop IRCing. I stopped IRCing really briefly, like, I don't know, it was probably five or six years ago, and then I figured out all I did was watch more TV, so I just went back to IRC, because it turned out it was more productive than not IRCing. Um, is, there, is there any sysadmins that don't IRC? How do you do your job? Like, you, you're, you're, both either, you're both clearly much, much smarter than I am, because I cannot get through a day without IRC and asking somebody some stupid question. All right, so, logging, right? And some sysadmins get around that. <laughs> there you right? So logging. Um, I only talked to one person who's had a logging problem today. Uh, and his solution was, if this works, it doesn't. Come on. There you go. All right. His solution was to log locally. Uh, who does that? Like, all your logs. Oh, God, really? Oh, jeez. I have customers that we have tried to log one stash. Okay, well, so you guys are often presented with this. And then you get to sort through that. And that's just awful. I don't know how you do it. I mean, I'm looking at this, and I'm looking at the files, and nothing's got a date stamp on it. Yes, I, I could show the date stamp on all of them. Um, then I've got a you know, grep for that date. And wait, I've got like two different versions of compression. Some things aren't compressed at all. Uh, some things are. Uh, some things don't even appear to be rotated, or just nothing's being kept. I have basically no idea what's going on there. Um, I know log rotates doing something, but to search through that is going to be miserable. Um, it's going to be miserable on one box. Uh, Sysadmins, how many of you admin a single box? Yeah. Okay. They don't need centralized logging. Uh, yeah, did, yeah. yeah, right. There. Good point. <laughs> yeah, so if you have a single box, this isn't the worst thing ever. It's not the best thing ever. It's, it's still pretty miserable, right? But if you've got like a thousand boxes, you end up with something stupid like that, right? With a, a horrible SSH for loop um, that even if you use you know, MSSH and you do this all in parallel, it's still horrible. right? You're going out and you're reaching out to a whole bunch of files and then piping them through something stupid. And at the end of the day, you probably still haven't solved your problem because you've spent all day crafting that big, long series of pipes. But it doesn't matter because by the time you found what you were looking for, 
chances are the problem is already fixed, and nobody cares anymore anyway because it's taken you so long to get them an answer. So you've moved on to the next thing. And the next thing is probably syslog. You have convinced all of your applications to shove stuff through syslog. You know, syslog was a really good idea at one point. Uh, somebody said, hey, let's take all the logs and put everything on just one line and send it somewhere. And that was OK. That, you know, 20, 30 years ago, that was fantastic and probably worked super well. Um, it doesn't really work as well anymore. Applications have gotten much, much more complex. They generate much, much more data. They, they generate a lot of structured data, and syslog has basically no structure. I'm fully aware that there's several RFCs out there for syslog. Um, they're the least descriptive things on Earth. Uh, they basically require you to do nothing correctly. Um, and even if you tried to do what they recommended, you'd still end up with something that was basically useless. Um, but let's just assume you go down the syslog path. Now, I'm shipping everything to a central syslog server. How do I lay things out? Do I do it by application? Maybe I do it by host name. Right, I've got a whole bunch of boxes, and I, maybe I shove things into their own directories by host name. Oh, good. Yay. This is basically exactly the same, except SSH isn't in there. So it's a little faster. It's still basically horrible, right? Because even if I can get into all those directories, and I mean, I could just shove everything into one big file, and that would be horrible, too. Oh, yeah. Bug. <laughs> I know it. Um, even if I did just shove everything into one big file, let's just say that I've got some sort of magic file system where everything I can shove into one big file and it all comes out instantly. That obviously doesn't exist, but let's just say it did. Um, I still have to process all of that somehow. I have to deal with this mass of unstructured crud. So I turn to scripts. And don't get me wrong. You can show everybody how to extract things from logs. No problemo. You can totally write a script to do that. And you could spend all day doing that, right? I need to get some errors out of uh, free iPhone on the blogonet.info's combined log. Um, great. So I'm looking for the string error. Wonderful. I'm probably going to get a ton of them, because I'm guessing whoever coded that is an idiot. Um, so I'm going to turn to awk eventually, because I'm going to need to break this down into some sort of fields, right? I, maybe I'm looking for uh, refers. Well, since it's a standard combine log, I know that it's going to be at the fourth position. I hope. I hope that somebody didn't go into the Apache config and change the definition of combined log, uh, also known as one of the most popular things to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so you don't know it's at the fourth spot. And you hire a new guy, and he doesn't know it's at the fourth spot. Did you put up a wiki that has your like config or something, and maybe a whole bunch of stuff for extracting from the logs? No, because people that don't keep the log system were Rails developers. Well, that's not always bad. <laughs> okay. You might still be smart. I don't know. What's that? <laughs> Make sure you stick them in the same file, too. That'll be easy to deal with. OK, so maybe we're just looking for refers. And that's not really that hard. I, of course, if I'm, you know, my application's taking 1,000 hits a second, and I'm just trying to get the fourth position out of there, this tells me basically nothing. I'm just getting a scrolling terminal. Uh, so maybe refers don't tell me anything. Maybe I just want to grab out uh, the response code. And then I want to sort it and find out how many of each response I got back. Fantastic. This will sum things up for me. And that'll work well as long as it's a really, really small log and you don't care anything about timestamps and you don't really care what range you're getting out of it. As long as you want the whole arbitrary time span of your log, that'll work really well. Of course, Maybe I want to know more than just the status code, because status codes are really only important if you know what page it served up. So we'll make the line a little longer. And maybe we're looking for you know four 404s. That doesn't tell us much. And so we're looking for anything that's a non-200. Can, can anybody read this? Is that, is that too small? Is that too small? OK, see, it doesn't actually matter if that's too small, because nobody can read it anyway. 
Even if it was huge, you wouldn't care if it was huge, because it'd be a pain in the ass to read, right? Even if everybody could see that in, in a really big font, I mean, don't get me wrong, I know what that does, but does your junior sysadmin know what it does? Does your help desk support know what it does? Your first level guys, the guys that get the first, first, you know, they pick up the phone, do they know how that works? The guys that you're paying like $15 an hour to be there at three in the morning to stop them from, to, to stop people from calling you, do they know how that works? No. So they're gonna call you. That's gonna suck. So eventually, you'll take it all and you'll put it in some scripts and you'll show them, oh look, now you just go dot, slash, and this will SSH into a thousand machines for you and give you the answer. Um, yeah, they're never going to use those, basically ever, um, because you'll change the log format or somebody else will change the log format and they'll all break and you'll never fix them. Can you tell I've been through this? Like, I've totally done this. I had a wiki, it had all these things on. It's just awful, nobody ever used it. And I became the guy. I was the guy that any time you needed something out of the logs, I'll go talk to Rashid, he'll figure it out. I don't know, he does some weird thing with awk. You don't want to be that guy. People will bother you all day. All you want to do is something interesting with your day. I, I don't even care what that is. It might be watching movies. Um, but it's way more interesting than crafting some horrible line of awk, which you're just hoping eventually gets out of your bash history so you never have to look at it again. <sighs> You've got other problems. Okay, so it's not just shipping logs that sucks, right? We were just looking at one example. We were looking through Apache logs. Log formats suck in general, even if you don't change them. Even if you haven't screwed with your combined log format, they still suck. Um, most of us know what that line is, right? We know what basically everything on that line means. Oh, quick question. What's the dash after the IP? Yeah. Oh. Yes, it is. It's in the combined log format. Yeah, look at that. You've probably been dealing with this for 10 years and you don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody cares. Because when they invented the combined log format, people still used IDENT. Nobody cares anymore. Even IRC servers don't care if you run it anymore. But it's still in there, and now it just shows up as a dash. And there's a stupid dash in every one of your, IRC, in every one of your Apache logs, and you don't care. The next thing's the username. Well, next, next thing's the timestamp. Well, look, we know how that thing works. But we really shouldn't have to. There's basically no context in that log. It, if you hadn't worked with that, and as we've shown, even if you do work with it, you may not know what everything in it is. And it's not like Apache is even the worst offender. How about MySQL? So, besides the obvious problems, um, why don't we timestamp every line? If you're trying to grep through that for an event that happened at, on a specific date, oh, you know, like, when the server started? Impossible. MySQL, for whatever reason, decided we don't need to timestamp every line of the log as long as it's basically the exact same time as the previous one. That's ridiculous. And that's still not the worst. I'm not sure this is the worst, but this has got to be close. What goes in the middle of those commas? What could possibly be in there? I could deal with this every day for my entire life, and I would never memorize what came after the 14th comma in a row that is apparently blank and unimportant in this line, but might be populated in the next one, or might never be populated. Who knows? This format is probably documented somewhere. Somebody wrote that document. Nobody ever read that document. And at very least, you know, like, we look through these last couple, and these are all probably somewhat standard, but it's not like this stuff carries over. The Apache combined format, pretty standard, unless you screw with it, most people do. SU, three different operating systems. It's like one of the oldest Unix utilities ever, and we haven't picked a format. I don't, I, I just, I'm simply baffled by this. Uh, not nearly as baffled as I am by dates. Have you ever tried to grep out? Okay, yes, I get it. Okay, now I get the joke. Um, anyway, have you ever tried to grep out uh, a date from a log. So 
you, assuming you know the month format, so you got to find that, and the position of the hour, and, you know, help you if there's more than one date format in that log. It's going to be miserable. Um, and really help you if, uh, if they don't even pick a date format that's got a time in it, um, or, for that matter, a date. Everybody knows what the first one up there is, right? Right, standard Unix timestamp. What time is it? You look at these like every day. What, you can't do that in your head? I can't do that in my head either. Yeah, right. <laughs> the next one is much more useful. I could read it. I don't know what year it happened in, but I know it was on March 19th, so let's hope that we're rotating that log, huh? Next one, much better. At least we know the year. Um, that could have happened in any given 24 different time slots across the globe because we decided that we don't need a uh, we, we don't need a time zone on that. Hopefully it's in UTC, but you don't actually know. Hopefully and time. hopefully, yep, totally. Um, and let's just hope that whatever application you're using to parse that. Uh, let's hope they all deal with time zones in the same way, and one doesn't assume UTC, and the other assumes local time. The next one, even worse, February 8th, 2005, August 2nd, 2005, May 2nd, 2008, who knows? I don't even know that it's a year or a date. Uh, it could just be a six-digit number they decided to stick in front of the time. Uh, who even knows? Okay, the last one. Yeah, yeah, local. Son of a jeez. You're the only person who has ever answered that. Like, correctly. That is... What is it again? First email. Yeah, so basically, somebody decided that, oh, well, the Unix timestamp's going to stop working eventually. Um, so we need to come up with another format for representing uh, times. Let's pick something less readable. If only we had something less readable than that. And to be fair, it's also high precision and slightly more compressed than the standard ISO 8601. But nonetheless, it's stupid, and I don't like it. <laughs> right? <laughs> so. You're that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, eventually, we turn to some kind of tool for dealing with this, and hopefully somebody gives us a budget for it. Uh, whatever they've assigned us probably isn't enough of a budget for it, but hopefully. Um, so we look at the commercial analysis space, and what we find is that, basically universally, the way that they do pricing is they say, per byte. This is ridiculous. Logs are not all worth the same. Value is not cost. Value and cost are two totally different things. The amount of value you extract from a particular event is completely separate from the amount that you paid to store it. Uh, for example, a stack trace versus an email log. The stack trace is actionable. You know exactly what happened, and because you ended up with a stack trace in your logs, you know that something probably went wrong. That's a high value event. It's something that you can make a proper change on and you can take action on, right? You know that something happened and there's an action that needs to be taken. An email or an HTTP 200, you have no idea. If you look at that in isolation, you have no idea if it's a problem or not, right? So a 200 might be a problem, but it might only be a problem if we served up a million of them. Or 404 might be an issue, but maybe only if we served up 10 million of them. We don't actually know. So despite the fact that we might pay the exact same amount for those two events, one might be worth 10 times more to us. But we're going to pay the same either way. Yo. And not to defend this company that I don't really know. Uh, but, but, um, but, but, but I think their point would be, if I were to them, I guess, is the more you store it, it's the fact that all that data is going to be available as the, 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 you can correlate it, yeah. is the value. Right. So, so then if you're going to store like, you know, uh, one 
uh, like a one terabyte a day with a lot. Mm -hmm. The fact that they're, in theory, instantly correlatable. Right. So, so it doesn't matter if, if you got a stack trace or like a... Well, but it matters to you, though, yeah. right? Because you've got high-value events, yeah. and you might not have the budget to okay. store a terabyte of stuff. Sure, sure. And so maybe you just end up storing the high-value events, because that's what you can afford, right? I mean, if, let's just say it costs me a penny to store each one, oh, I right? I can get away with storing a lot less if I can filter down what's just high-value. Yeah. So great. So now I've already identified all the high-value stuff, and I can't afford to actually do the analysis. So you sold me this big data analysis thing, but all I can deal with is small data sets without paying an enormous amount of money for it. It's a pricing model that works really well for them and really poorly for just about everybody else. So open source to the rescue. Commercial analysis things, they might someday come up with a better pricing structure. They haven't done it yet, um, but there's really no better pricing structure than free. Um, there's, it's particularly hard to compete with, for, with free. Yes, although puppies cost money. I don't know, I'm not a dog person. Anyway, so but the particular stack we're going to talk about is Logstash, uh, Elasticsearch, and Kibana. Oh, I should really disclaim this. I work for Elasticsearch. Um, I did not used to. When I started writing Kibana, I didn't work for them. They hired me later. I should have disclaimed that at the beginning. Hopefully everybody already knew that. Um, I swear this isn't a sales pitch. OK, excellent. Fantastic. Yeah, that's true. You know, I think the salespeople do, but I don't know how they work. I... Anyway, so, yeah, right. I'd rather be doing cool stuff than selling stuff. Uh, oh, we also employ the Logstash guy now. He's joined a few weeks ago, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, he and I started working together about two years ago, just informally, and we never had any idea that we would end up working at the same place, so we're both super excited about it. Anyway, Logstash is essentially a kind of pipe for the network. Um, it takes in data from a whole bunch of sources. This can be anything from a file to a network socket. It can parse out particular protocols. In fact, it's got a whole bunch of inputs. I didn't even list them all here because there's so many of them. I really only tried to stick to the ones that I use a lot. Um, first one is AMQP for consuming queues. It can bring in from files. Uh, if you have a Redis server, that can store up lists. It can consume from that. Uh, TCP, if for some reason you want to index Twitter, it can do that. Uh, I implore you, please do not. There are enough companies analyzing social data. It's all worthless. It's 13-year-olds griping out whatever 13-year-olds gripe about these days. Is there a 13-year-old in the room? Not here anymore? Well, that's too bad. I wanted to see what they griped about these days. Anyway, it can take in a whole bunch of stuff from a whole bunch of places. And then it can do stuff with it. Now, the stuff it does with it solves those problems we looked at earlier. Um, particularly, the date filter can take all of those uh, date formats, give them a format, and turn them into a nice, pretty, standard ISO 8601 date stamp with all of the stuff you actually need to understand what time it is. The Z at the end is, uh, is the time zone, if you didn't know that. Some people don't. Um, what about those nasty formats we looked at? Well, oh, I forgot to highlight it, but it's the tiny gray one that says grok. Grok is basically a way of naming regular expressions. And yes, I know regular expressions are a big pain sometimes, but they're necessary sometimes for parsing unstructured data. So behind all of those capital letters there, uh, capitalized words, are named regular expression patterns. After the colon is the field name that we're going to stick them in. So we can take something like a very tiny, and that's an easy to understand log, and actually give it context. So we know that jobs is the controller, the action was to show, we got a status code, and how long it took. There is no way that I would know that if I just looked at that in a log. The Logstash can do all sorts of other stuff with the with your events too. In fact, the new version just came out. It's Logstash 1.2. Uh, I didn't even have time to cover it. It's got so many crazy new features that I've really just included a subset of what was available in the last version. Uh, but 
It can hash fields. It could use DNS to look stuff up. Say you wanted to normalize IPs into host names or host names into IPs. It can perform all those lookups and store them in a separate field for you. So you can actually correlate IPs and not have to grep through for host names and just hope they're in the same IP space as some other thing. Uh, once you've made them into IPs, you can use the GeoIP lookup to figure out if there's one data center in Lansing, Michigan that has a really crummy chef recipe that is for some reason downloading something from you every 20 seconds and actually makes up a significant portion of your traffic. Ask me how I know. <laughs> the metrics filter is super cool. Does anybody use StatsD? StatsD users? No? StatsD is this thing. Oh, OK. See, you guys are doing some stuff, right? Um, what's that? Okay. okay. Anyway, uh, StatsD is this thing for counting stuff up. So say I was just constantly taking in a stream of status codes. Every five or ten seconds, uh, this metrics filter will count how many uniques of each of those I got and then generate another event based on them. So I can do stuff like stick them on a histogram and I can see that I got, you know, 20 404s and whatever. Anyway, um, you can also just pass it right off to Ruby and deal with the event in Ruby, whatever you think of Ruby. I personally like it, but hey, whatever. Um, anyway, there's a whole bunch of filters. You can do a whole bunch of stuff with them. You should go check out Logstash. It's super cool. But after we've taken everything in, right, we've decided I'm going to just start forwarding all of my syslog stuff. Say I've already got a legacy syslog network, right, and lots of people have. And I want to put it into some sort of structured format. I want to use Grok to put it into fields. Uh, you can take in syslog traffic over the UDP input. So let's say that I've already done this. I've normalized all of my date stamps into something nice. I've given all of my events context with Grok. I should probably stop for a second here. Chances are, if you're having to use Grok, and you're working in a environment which you have all of the control over the logs, you may or may not be. If you can avoid it, don't use Grok. Just send your logs in JSON. That's all that is. It's just a JSON data structure. Logstash has a JSON input. Just ship them all in JSON. It's a little bit more network traffic, but it's worth it. It'll save you an enormous amount of processing. It'll save you from having to write a awful, awful regular expression that you will hate. And you'll be able to process stuff a lot faster because you won't have to use all those CPU cycles to run that regular expression. And regular expressions, while appearing to be fast, are really, really slow. So after you've done all that, let's say you've passed it through Grok or you're just shipping in JSON, you got to put it somewhere. All right? You can just shove it on a file on a disk, and then you can try to parse out JSON with a regex. Anybody ever done that? Dude, how bad is that? It's just awful. There's a command line tool called JQ that makes it slightly less bad, but it's still basically horrible. So don't ever do it. Load it into something that understands JSON and do it with that. Why were you? Why? Awful. Oh yeah. See, so stop, invi stop inventing log formats, people. We just don't need any more of them. Uh, it just serialize it in some some normalize some normal way. Just just pick one. Don't invent a serializer. You know who I'm talking to. Um, anyway, obviously the place that uh, I usually tend to stick logs is in Elasticsearch. Has anybody used Elasticsearch? Yeah, okay, cool, couple, neat. Um, yeah, so the place I tend to stick them is in Elasticsearch, mostly because none of the other outputs puts are particularly good for searching through logs, which is usually what I want to do with my logs. Now, I've got a bunch of others. I could stick them in a queue and consume them from another application that parses them. Uh, you could send them to email. You could just run something every time you wanted to do it with the exec output. Um, that's going to be tremendously expensive. Don't do that. You can stick them in a file. You could send them off to Graphite. You said StatsD, but do you, anybody Graphite users? What's that? Hmm. You might know, be thinking of two different stats Ds. No. Okay. Um, 
Graphite doesn't work very well on a horizontal scale. Stats D should work okay just because. But you can use the metrics filter and whatever. In any case, you got a whole bunch of outputs that you can do stuff with. But particularly, the one that I want to talk about is Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch, I think, is super neat. Again, I worked there, so take that with a grain of salt if you'd like, but I was pretty hip on it before they hired me. Obviously, I had written an application that used it. So, Elasticsearch is entirely schema-free. All those log formats, you do not have to figure out what they look like ahead of time. This is not a MySQL database. There are no columns. You do not have to deal with that. You do not have to try to pick a generalized schema that for some, in some awful way will fit all your logs. You can define n fields and just index them. Uh, it clusters wildly easy. Um, I actually got a good story about this. Uh, I have two good stories about this effect. Does anybody have a Raspberry Pi? Ow, okay, lots of Raspberry Pi owners, excellent. Uh, anybody figure out anything useful to do with theirs? <laughs> One, what, what are you doing with yours? Did you do something with it? Uh, oh, you. X, um, run X, yeah, X, yeah. All right, so, yeah, sort of. It runs okay, it does all right, so. Nice, all right. What'd you do with yours? Very cool. That's awesome. Um, mine I just stream music to. Um, I tried to get uh, Elasticsearch working on it, and it turns out it works just fine. Um, I use the uh, JDK uh, 8 um, because it supports the yeah because it supports the hardware floating point unit on the Pi. Uh, JDK 7 does not. Uh, it's actually like a 10 times performance increase if you grab JDK 8 and load it on the Pi. Point being that I stuck Elasticsearch on it and then promptly forgot about it. And Elasticsearch just went about its business sitting over there on my on my network on my Pi. Um, the issue was is that I forgot to change my cluster name, and so I loaded up my laptop. And the way Elasticsearch works, by default, is it uses multicast to discover other Elasticsearch nodes on your network. So I go to index like three million things into Elasticsearch. I'm like, man, this is taking a really long time. Yeah, it was replicating everything to my Raspberry Pi over Wi-Fi to its SD card. There was also another situation where a coworker and I were at a conference. Um, both of us had just started at the company, and both of us forgot to change our cluster name. Hey, Igor, I have all your data now. Yeah, so it speaks JSON over HTTP. It's super easy to interact with. Uh, it's. Are you saying that if we all set up Elasticsearch with the default cluster name on our home network, we can cross back up everywhere? Um, it's probably not a good idea. Um, if you did, if you used unicast, you probably could, because obviously multicast network isn't, uh, traffic isn't going to leave your network. But uh, it's probably not a good idea. Um, in general, distributed systems over unreliable network links are a bad move. Um, it's entirely open source. The source is on GitHub. You are free to hack on it. It's Apache license. You can do just about anything you'd like with it. Um, and it does search and aggregation. So, unfortunately, that really wasn't good enough for me. Um, it was nice, because now I had this nice search syntax, but I was still doing everything on the command line. So it was a lot faster than trying to grep through logs. Everything was in one place, everything had normalized times. It was easy for me to use, but again, I was the guy who built it, so every time there was a problem, somebody would come and poke me to figure out what happened. And I did not want to search logs, even if they were easier to search now. That really wasn't what I wanted to do with my time. I wanted to go do something cool, like watch movies or whatever. So I decided I'm going to do cool stuff. Kibana was the cool thing that I decided to do. It was my way of not having to search logs anymore. It was my way of getting everyone else to search logs. So when my boss came to me with a hunch that x was y, I said, go prove to me that x is y, then come back and I'll take care of it. Here's a nice interface for dealing with it. It went through a couple of evolutions, but these days it's all HTML5 and JavaScript. 
The reason it's all HTML and five and JavaScript is because Elasticsearch is restful. It's JSON over HTTP. There's really no reason to have any other interface in between there. If you do need to secure it, you can do it with a proxy. Depends on your network requirements. What's up? So how about stuff like you're doing like save and search, or you want to have like send event where you can say when this event matches, email me back. You know, like that that kind of crap. If you want to do matching events, you can do it through Logstash. Uh, it has an email output. You can tag stuff and have it send you an email. It can also relay stuff off to uh, Nagios for you if you've got an alerting system set up or if you're but using. You know, like web components, do you do that? Do you have to do it through Logstash? Not yet. We're working on it. Yeah. We're working on it. Um, the benefit of it being HTML5 and JavaScript is that there is no dealing with ridiculous PHP modules. Uh, horrible Ruby gems, whatever Python uses. Um, you don't have to deal, I'm not much of a Python guy. Um, you don't have to deal with any of that. It's just HTML and JavaScript. You can load it up in your browser without a server if you'd like and point it at an Elasticsearch instance. It's entirely open source. It would be difficult to close source since it's HTML5 and JavaScript. Um, and the goal of it is to let you do stuff without actually having to write any code. Because while I enjoy writing code, your level one support guys, besides not enjoying it, may not know how to do it. And here's generally what it kind of looks like. Um, these interfaces are not static. You can build stuff up and design pretty much anything you want out of these using configurable panels. Um, by default, it doesn't look like this. It's much simpler. I'll show you the default in a second. But you can build out histograms, bar charts, line charts, uh, just tables of stuff. There's a light and a dark color scheme, and the colors are all configurable, and it's pretty, and management likes it, and actually enjoys using it because it's all flashy, so they won't bother you to use it. Pie charts, yada, yada. Uh, if you're using the GOIP filter, you can take stuff and stick it on a map and drill down into it. Uh, it'll do nice little heat maps for you. Yeah, there's uh, there's not a lot of state persistence, um, but if you want to save stuff, it'll save it to a special index in Elasticsearch for you. Um, and it ships with a couple of different proxy configurations for password protecting uh, the endpoints to save to and that sort of stuff. So. You can at least somewhat secure it. I still wouldn't suggest putting it on the internet, but you should know that by now. If you want to get it, and I'll do a demo in a second, um, you can grab it off of Elasticsearch.org, uh, or you can just go directly to the source. All Elasticsearch.org is going to do is link you to the GitHub repo anyway. Uh, it exists under the Elasticsearch organization. Like I said, incredibly easy to install. There is no build process. There is Nothing to build at all. Um, there's no web. You probably should set up a web server, but Firefox will let you get away with just going to open. Uh, Chrome will not let you get away with that because it will uh, fork on the cross origin stuff. Firefox, for some reason, doesn't care. So, yeah, uh, demo. Yeah. <coughs> So, when you first install it, you get something like this. Uh, it's really just a screen to kind of give you an overview of what you're dealing with, what the requirements are, yada, yada. Really not worth reading right now, but let's just say that you are using it with Logstash. There's a pre-built dashboard for Logstash. When I say dashboard, these are really just interfaces, right? It's a fairly flexible interface. So, let's click on that. For some reason, I've got a browser thing at the top. Interesting. Can I get away from that? Yeah. Nope. That's better. Okay. So, this is kind of what we're dealing with, and this is a fairly low-resolution screen. Let me see if I can make that a little better. Not really. Well, that'll do. So, here's what you get by default. Obviously, a lot less flashy than the thing you were looking at a minute ago, but... Let's say we wanted to search for something. Um, let's look for all HTML files over the course of the last 24 hours. 
Or how about something less prevalent? CSS? There we go. All right, so we've got all CSS files. Let's say we want to look for a few different file types. Use this little plus icon to build out a few different things. Let's look for HTML, uh, PHP, let's look for CSS, and PNG. All right, we can see the breakdown of each of those. Um, I'm not really a big fan of stacked bar charts. This is how everyone seems to do it by default, so this is how I ship it. But you can change that from stacked bar charts if you like. Let's get rid of the bars. Let's use lines. Let's not stack them. Let's not area fill. That's better. All right. I don't like stacks because stacks, one bar at the bottom has an undue influence on the one on top of it. It makes it difficult to compare things. All right. So I can see my trends, but let's say I want to break down into specific log events. There's a table at the bottom that lets you do that. I know this is hard to read, tiny font. Let's make it a little bigger. There we go. Um, so by default, it shows you the JSON event, which is not useful. That's just as bad as regular log line. In fact, it's probably worse because it's, it's full of a whole bunch of field names. So you can expand it, and you can see the actual fields that are defined. Further. Let's say you wanted to see an actual table. Uh, let's look at the client IP. All right, so we can see it's changed to client IP. And uh, let's see the response code and the refer. Close that up. There we go. I've got a nice table of stuff. Let's say that. I've got some developer that's done something ridiculous, and I think I've got something that's using a whole bunch of memory. Let's drop PHP memory in there. Hmm, interesting. We only have one field that has PHP memory. Chances are that's because most of the files we're serving up are not PHP files. So show me only PHP files. All right, so we've got only PHP files. We're still going to have some things that don't have any memory associated with them. Although, let's get rid of refer and show the actual request. All right, so now I've got the actual request. Move that over to. All right, let's say that I want to see the highest memory using request. I can sort that so I can see what's actually using the most. Now, Kibana tries really hard to be as light on things as it can. So basically, what it's doing is it's doing a sequential search throughout your Elasticsearch indexes. It's only hitting one index at a time. Because it knows that every event has a timestamp, and because Logstash will create a daily index with a tag on it, so it'll create, say, Logstash-2013.09.12, Kibana knows what possible indexes things could be in. So it'll only hit them one at a time, which is why it takes a second to build the graph because it's going back and making that request for each one. Likewise, when it's sorting logs, it's doing the same thing. And you can kind of catch it very briefly there, but you can kind of see it backfilling as it goes. So it's grabbing out all that stuff from the logs and then filling it in as it gets it. It just assumes that you probably want the most recent data first, so it hits the most recent index first. But let's get rid of that PHP filter. So. If you click on the little filters thing here, you can drop down a list of the filters that have been applied. So you saw it earlier, I picked out just PHP files. Let's get rid of that and see all files. Maybe I want to see a breakdown of which one of these is the most popular. I mean, obviously, I can kind of guess from the graph that, what's green, HTML is the most popular. But let's say I want to see that in a different format. Let's make the histogram smaller. All right, so we made ourselves some room. And let's add, this is the terms panel. Basically, this will look at everything in a field and show you all the different unique values in that field. So let's just look at log type. I know that this web server, uh, is uh, this uh, log store is dealing with both Nginx and Apache. So I want to see a breakdown of Nginx and Apache logs. So I'm going to search on type. I can leave the length at 10. Let's make it a little bigger. 
All right, so I can see Apache is quite a bit more. Maybe I don't want to see missing or other, and make it a pie chart instead. Yeah, there we go. Cool, so now I've got a nice pie chart. Um, I can do all sorts of stuff. Maybe I don't care about the histogram at all. Get rid of the histogram and add, say, a map, and do a map of the world. And we'll do geo.country, make it nice and big. Cool, I can see a breakdown of where all my visitors are coming from. All the stuff is, as you can see, pretty fluid, right? I can build out dashboards for anybody who needs it, and then I can save them. It saves to Elasticsearch. Uh, if you register an OAuth domain with GitHub, it can save them off to GISTs. It can also set it as, it can use HTML5 local storage to just set it as the default for you. It can also export them to files, so you can export the dashboard schema to a file and email it to somebody if you're some kind of weirdo. Um, so we'll call this the map dashboard, save it off to Elasticsearch, and then we can load it from that link. We don't have to save them like this if you just want to save, share links with somebody, say you've built something kind of ad hoc and don't care to save it, you can generate, ah, you can generate temporary URLs that you can send off to folks. And I think that's really about it. So like that URL mm -hmm. points to a state that saves in, in, in the left of the or? Yeah. So it could, um, when, you, when you click the share button, it will save that uh, under that, uh, that hashed ID at the end there. Uh, it'll save that for, I think, by default, 30 days. And so that URL will exist. That's all configurable. In fact, just about everything everywhere is very configurable. I try to expose as many configuration parameters as I can. Uh, there is a configuration file. It contains like three things, only one of which you'd ever have to change. It's just the Elasticsearch server to point at. Basically, everything else can be configured uh, through the interface. Let's see. Yeah, and you can turn off what you can save to and all that good stuff. Uh, there's a button there, and if you want to configure the panels, when you mouse over them, little configuration things will appear. So yeah, it's interface for analyzing logs. Any questions? No? All right. Well, so, so when you were first doing this uh, application, was log, was, uh, was gray log 2? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and you saw it, you thought that it was a good interface or? Um, so the reason that, actually the reason I wrote this is because I saw Greylog 2 and I was like, wow, this is amazing. This is exactly what I was looking for. Then I pointed my logs at it and it could take about 20 minutes worth of them before it keeled over. This is back when it only used MongoDB. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it just completely ate it. Um, it switched to Elasticsearch, but they switched to just using one big index. Um, so it still couldn't handle it. I think he uses multiple indexes now. Uh, but I've already got something I use, so. <laughs> uh, and the interface, at least for Greylog 2 at the moment, is fairly static. Um, it doesn't have a lot of the analysis capabilities that we were looking for. So he's catching up. And, 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 and I ask you, um, there's that project from the, uh, from the, Mozilla people, their little log statue type of thing. Hecka. Yeah, so how do you guys view that? Does it fit into this ecosystem mm -hmm. or is it? Yeah, um, the Mozilla guys, uh, they're actually big Kibana users. Um, they they designed Hecka because they wanted something simpler from than Logstash. Yeah. They didn't need, Logstash is very much so a Swiss army knife. I say if you've got a legacy infrastructure, and you need something that can handle logs from an enormous amount of different sources, Logstash is the way to go. Um, if you don't, Hecka might work for you. Uh, it's only been out for a fairly short time. Uh, there's a few other solutions too. There's Flume, which is also very similar to Logstash, and FluentD. Uh, FluentD is very insistent on JSON. Uh, it has a few less inputs, but it's apparently very fast. I've not used it, but apparently pretty cool. I'm a big fan of Logstash. Uh, it was kind of the thing that was around when I was really looking for something to deal with my ridiculous network and all the other, all the weird stuff on it. I did not have a particularly homogenous network. 
So Logstash could handle so many different inputs. Can you show us looking at a Java um, log, like if there's a um, if, if there's a stack trace, like how that looks in there? Uh, I don't have any in here, um, but Logstash has a multi-line filter and patterns for uh, Java stack traces, and it can reassemble Java stack traces uh, to fit them all into one event. So you'll have the event in the table, but it'll just appear as one section of the table instead of a whole bunch of lines, so you can properly search for them. Um, to be honest with you, you probably shouldn't ship that through syslog or something. You should probably use log4j for it. Um, yeah, whatever. Um, Oh, okay. I haven't. I haven't used the. It has a. It has a specific log4j input. Um, yeah. Well, I haven't used it though. Nice. Nice. Why do you have to write your own input? Um, because there isn't one there yet. What is it? Yeah, it's oh. It's very live job Lovely. <laughs> I'm sure it's very efficient. Yeah. I think Flume also has an elastic search output too. I know they yeah. do actually. Mm -hmm. I haven't used it. Yeah, it kind of defeats the point. <laughs> We also have a Elasticsearch also has a connector to uh, HDFS too. Uh, it's it's relatively new. Uh, I haven't yeah, used I it yet. It'll allow you to import using uh, Hive or Pig directly into Elasticsearch from HDFS. But I haven't used it yet, so I can't tell you how good it is. I assume it's good. Yeah, probably. Yeah, so I don't know if anybody else has any other questions or just wants to talk logs. Let's well, be covered on actually, I think the answer, but my question was going to be, so if you have a log format that isn't already known mm -hmm. through this infrastructure, do you create your own rules for parsing it and Yep, if it's already a uh, string, you can use Grok to do that. Um, otherwise, writing inputs for Logstash is really simple. Um, it's it's Java, but it's just Ruby underneath it. It uses JRuby. Uh, so if you can do Ruby, you can almost certainly write an input for whatever you're looking for. Uh, same deal with filters and outputs. They're all really easy to write. Um, I haven't written a lot of Logstash stuff. The last thing that I wrote for Logstash was a uh, basically a throttle filter. I desperately needed to run it on an EC2 micro, and I need. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, so I needed to be able to look at load on the system and stop processing logs when it got too high, so that the micro didn't end up throttled by AW the uh, EC2 infrastructure. <laughs> Probably would have been faster. Can you just give an example of a policy of how you would keep what I mean like say you had a Yes. Like a, a typical thing like like a, like um, how you would deploy this at like maybe a twenty server Yes. You know, some some typical small business you know, I don't know. Like, I know, like, every situation is different, but I mean, I just kind of know, like, what would be, like, a, a policy of how you would do 
All right, so, oops, okay, so that's probably about as big as I can get. Um, this was actually my infrastructure at one point. Um, it's not the most beautiful chart in the world, but it works. Uh, so, we'll ignore that at the bottom, um, because that was really just for system vitals that I wanted to get into Graphite. But basically, I had a whole bunch of logs. Uh, this was before I started shipping stuff with JSON. Um, say you just had a legacy syslog network, and you just wanted to start getting all of your syslog data into Elasticsearch, this is a way you could do it. Um, chipped everything from UD with UDP because I didn't particularly care if I got every single log because they were web server logs, just wasn't that big of a deal to me. Ended up in Syslog NG. Um, I used Syslog NG for doing uh, archiving. So at the same time that I was dumping things to disk with uh, a centralized Syslog server, I also had a line in my Syslog NG config that was forwarding them on to Logstash which just had a UDP input. Logstash was then taking them and putting them into RabbitMQ because I ran all of this stuff on like a shoestring. And so I really needed queuing just in case things got backed up. Um, queuing also let me selectively take down my uh, Logstash filter boxes. So I ran a whole bunch of filter boxes because, well, first time, first, when I first set this up, uh, because I had to parse every single line, pretty expensive to run all of those regular expressions. Um, so I had a array of three of them. It also gave me enough redundancy that I could take one down for changes and still be able to process everything. So I would have Logstash pulling out of RabbitMQ and then putting back into another RabbitMQ instance. Um, this was simply so that I could take down my Elasticsearch server. If you are using, if you have multiple Elasticsearch servers, you don't have to really worry about this. It'll fail over and just end up at a different server. So basically, I used two queues, sent everything over syslog, forwarded to logstash, filtered, processed, sent it to another queue, threw it into Elasticsearch, and pulled it all back out with Kibana. Um, when I looked at the logstash a long time ago, it seemed like the suggested configuration was to deploy logstash to every server to do extra watch logs and then mm -hmm. use it as a way he would then transport your log to uh, Yeah, you, you can do that. Um, but you didn't do that, though, right? I didn't do that because I already had a syslog server, um, so I didn't need to read out of files. Uh, if you need to read out of files, you can deploy Logstash to every box. You may or may not want to. It can pre-process a few items too, right? It can. Uh, of course, you're going to incur any overhead that you, you would. Um, it's also going to be slightly more difficult to do config pushes because you're going to have to push it to all of those nodes instead of some centralized filter nodes. Um, you can also, if you want a lighter weight solution than Logstash, because Logstash is Java, if you don't, I mean, I'm not going to knock on Java, Java's great, um, but if you want something with a slightly smaller, much smaller memory footprint, um, there is a tool called Lumberjack, also written by the Logstash author. <coughs> His name's uh, Jordan, great guy. Uh, logs, uh, Lumberjack is much, much lighter, uh, can do SSL also, uh, and that can ship to Logstash. So you can have that read out of files and ship to Logstash if you'd like. So then, but you're saying in here, if you have a centralized Logstash server, for all your parts, everything is, all of your processing of logs, the, um, all of the rest, all the processing, I like, mm -hmm. I prefer the I prefer the centralized method just because I don't terribly want to hand off log processing duties to uh, the application nodes. I don't want to the I don't want to take the chance of impacting their performance for parsing logs. So I prefer this I, I prefer this setup. But whatever works in your network. So with that, how, what kind of volume, when you test this, what kind of volume of logs do you use to your... your um, <laughs> we have, we've run this up to 100,000 a second. Um, wow. Yeah, so it's pretty much, I mean, that's what we've run it up to. In real world situations, it's going to depend on the amount of log processing you're doing, how strong the nodes are, what your elastic search cluster could handle. Um, 100,000 a second was shoving them into a seven-node Elasticsearch cluster um, uh, of 
of uh, documents, I couldn't even tell you. <laughs> um, it was it was faked Apache logs. We were just benchmarking, um, and I'm not really certain we were at the limit at that point. Um, real world, um, and these are just setups that I know of. Uh, I know somebody's doing 16,000 a second. Um, my setup, uh, this was at uh, Village Voice Media, uh, also known as the Phoenix New Times and a bunch of other papers. Uh, my setup topped out at about 6,500 events a second. Um, but I was shoving all that into a single elastic search instance with not a whole lot of memory and spinning disks. So, and I probably wasn't topped out because elastic search wasn't the bottleneck at that point. It was my incredibly complex filter chain that was the bottleneck. So yeah, it, it'll probably handle most networks. Anything else? No? Cool. All right. I'm done.